Thank you, brother. You folks may take a place in the congregation. I have that in my notes not to forget that tonight. I also need to make mention, please, that this coming Wednesday night at 6.30 will be the beginning session for the workers of the Vacation Bible School, and it is very important for all workers to be at those training sessions so that we are all on the same page during our Vacation Bible School. Well, now then, I must admit I enjoyed that special number very, very, very much. And it is kind of going to be a great thing, a greater number indeed, because of my message tonight, I want to talk a little bit about church music. And of course, I cannot speak about church music without speaking of the world's music also. And I am happy to think to myself that here at Trinity, we have at least what, in my humble opinion, is good God-honoring, Christ-honoring music. I trust that it's a blessing to your heart. I don't know about you, but I love music. And I love it when it draws my heart closer to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Not all music is that way, and I think it is important for us to consider this a little bit this evening. In many regards, I need not, I guess, speak to this crowd about music because a crowd like ours is going to want the old-fashioned style of music in church anyway. In other words, most of you people would be aghast if you came in here some Sunday morning and the hymnals were all gone and uh, there were no uh, words except what was on the projector up on the wall, and uh, you would uh, flop over dumbfounded if you were to come in here and see a mess of electric guitars and uh, a trap set <laughs> and uh, a bank of loud speakers up here and a bunch of guys with with uh, longer style hair and uh, 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 clothes on that would speak more of a rock band, you'd think, uh, uh, what happened to the preacher? Uh, you'd have a right to think what happened to the preacher because as long as I'm around, uh, we're not going to be having that kind of thing here. Well, I say, uh, I mean, I again am speaking to uh, what I think a friendly crowd when I address this subject, but I want to address it anyway. I'd like to read, uh, please, first of all, from Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse 18 and 19. That's Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse 18 and 19. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now being filled with the Spirit is going to result in this, if I may put it in that vein at this particular time. Verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'd like to invite you to turn with me over to the book of Colossians for a scripture that is kindred to this one. In Colossians chapter number 3, and I am going to read... Um, Beginning, I think I'll go back to verse number 12 to set the scene, please. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, uh, the love of God in action, which is the bond of perfectness. 
and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now look at it, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now having read that, I would just like to give a few thoughts, if I may, along the lines of music. But I would like to bring your attention to this thought, please that probably there are two major ways in which uh, a church service will be noted, and there are two major areas in which one uh, would want to have at their church, uh, two major areas in which you can serve the Lord. And when I come to the church service, there are two very important things. One of them is the music of the church. Do you realize that all the way through the Bible, and this is just not the Old Testament, but it is especially prominent in the Old Testament, I cannot stress that too much. All I need to do is to refer to King David and the temple setting and the setting up of the singers and the musicians in the area of serving God there, and that ought to trigger your thinking automatically to the glory of God. God and music. But when we come to the New Testament, we likewise have this setting of Ephesians and Colossians as well as other places. Remember that um, after they had sung an hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. I want to cite some verses in the Bible to try to lay a little bit of groundwork for our thinking in music in the Bible. Now the second way that one is going to be serving the Lord and that you want in the church service is the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. In other words, the congregational singing is indispensable. The choir singing to me is indispensable. Musical numbers from the proper instruments that are uh, going to be speak of the holiness of God God is indispensable, but I might put this into place here for our thought process. It is the foolishness of preaching by which it pleased God to save them that believe. And we can witness for the Lord, we can have the Word of God preached, and in some ways it may be said the Word of God sung. The, the messages may be in some way sung, for as we sing our hymns out of the book, as we sing our courses even, these courses and these songs have messages to them. We are giving our testimony of our love to Christ, or we are in some cases singing a prayer, seeking God's uh, help in our lives, and in some cases we are praising God for what he has done for us, but it is all to be to the glory of God. I then before I look at these particular scriptures just briefly, would like to say that there are three ways that you can tell a lot about a church when you walk into that church and when you go through one service of that church. One of the ways that you can tell a lot about a church is by the way the people are dressed when they go up to that church. I know that there are a lot of churches in our day that say, come casual. I'm going to have more to say about dress when I get around uh, to the area where I figure I can step on most people's toes and uh, get a quick exit. I'll say more about that. But brothers and sisters, i got to tell you right now, uh, there are people who will dress better to go to the wedding than they go to the uh, house of God, right? There are people who will dress up more to go to a funeral than they go to the house of God. And the, the, many churches have taken on this attitude of uh, all come casual. I think we ought to get right with God and go to church. 
I think it is important for us to skip the casual business, and I think it's time for us to decide that we are coming before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and it is right that we put some effort into our going up to the Church of God. And a little bit of that is in regards to dress. Now, you can tell a lot about a church by the way the people are dressed. Now, I've got to be careful. I want to hedge on this area just a little bit. Uh, people have got to realize and understand that not everybody has the same background that I may have had. Not everybody may have grown up in a pastor's home where when I was a little kid my dad and mom bought me a suit and a tie to wear to church. Uh, not everybody comes that way. And there are people out there on different levels of maturity brothers and sisters. So be kind, be careful, tend to your Yourself in your dress in other words and I think that it is important for us to realize that that uh, person who may come in uh, may look a little different or something hey uh, that person may need our love and our testimony and they may need our uh, kindness and our graciousness and our trying to make them feel at home because you got to remember we're trying to get people saved we're trying to get people into church. Don't ever forget that. But that doesn't mean that we're supposed to uh, drop all of the holiness of Jesus Christ and go down to their level. We're trying to raise people to a higher level of holiness before our Savior Jesus Christ. So one of the ways you can tell a lot about a church is by the way people dress when they go into church. Um, I, I am... a amazed personally at the pastors in this day and age that uh, uh, the way they dress. Man, uh, uh, well, I want to talk about, I don't want to step on anybody's toes in this message tonight. I want to remain a nice guy tonight. So I'll go there another time. But uh, you can tell uh, by the way uh, uh, the deacons dress, by the way the pastor dresses. I, yeah, you can tell a lot by the way the pastor's wife dresses in this day and age. And I am thankful for a wife that I don't have to worry about the modesty or the classiness of the way she dresses when she goes to church, boy. I praise God for that. And she is an example, and you are an example, like it or not. Another way that you can tell a lot about a church is when you first walk in and look up on the platform. If you see a, a choir loft, that'll tell you one thing. Now, some churches may not be big enough to have a choir. Hey, cut them some slack. When we started out in Barstow, I used a choir more like a, an ensemble, uh, so to speak. Uh, you you kind of make do with what God gives you to work with at the time. Uh, but if you were to walk in and see a, a drum set up on the platform, unless it's a kettle drum, now, uh, pardon me, timpani. I shouldn't have said kettle drum, should I? A uh, timpani, unless it's a timpani, that's an orchestra instrument. Uh, to me, that would be fitting to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But if you walk into a church auditorium and you see a rock group drum set up on the platform, beware. If you see a bunch of electronic guitars and so on, beware. Now, I know what some of you are going to say. Well, you say, Brother Burkholder, you got an electronic digital organ up there. I know that. Do you know what a real life pipe organ costs? <laughs> And so, uh, digitally, uh, uh, to me, this Johansson is about as close as you can come to a pipe organ sound, frankly. Uh, there are organs made to what they call American Guild of Organists specifications for, now get this, church organs. In other words, this isn't a rock concert organ up here. 
This is a church organ up here, and we hope to glorify the name of the Lord out of it. You can tell, in short, a lot by the instruments that are on the platform. Uh, you can tell a lot by our church, by the number of young people that play uh, instruments, the brass instruments, the string instruments, the flutes, and so on. You can tell a lot about the church by the young people that are participating in the music program of the church, by the songs the choir sings, by the musical instruments that are given. That'll tell you a lot about the church. And a third way you can tell a lot about a church right off the bat is whether or not they use the King James Version of the Bible. Now, I tell you, brothers and sisters, that's being loosened up on in this day that we live in. And as I said years and years ago, the devil's going to drop a bomb one of these days, and people are going to be wondering what the Word of God is. They're going to be looking over at their neighbor and saying, what does yours say? Uh, what does yours say? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the devil's going to drop a bomb, and pretty soon people are going to say, well, they don't know what the Word of God is. Man, if the church of Jesus Christ doesn't know what the Word of God is? How do you expect to sell it to the world? Well, we're not selling it anyway. How do you expect to get it out there to the world? This is the inspired Word of God when we don't even know what it is. And you can tell a lot about a church by the Word of God that they use. Why, in some churches I've been in, we could no more have our verse that we do at the beginning of the service than uh, the man in the moon. It'd be like the confusion of tongues. Do you guys realize that? When God I'd be reading out of this and another guy would be reading out of that. If it's all the same, you can put me down on that side of the crowd that believes I've got the Holy Word of God. It doesn't need to be improved upon. It needs to improve upon me. I grant you that. But I don't need to go around trying to improve the Word of God. And there are reasons, believe you me, the more I study, the more convinced I am that it's all there, right, as we have it in the King James James version of the Bible. And people say, well, I can't understand what that means. You mean to tell me you can't understand Jesus wept? <laughs> I think the problem is a lot of times people don't want to have to go to the trouble to study to find out what those words really mean. And in case, for whatever it's worth, there's a reason why those words are translated the way they are uh, from the manuscripts. And of course it comes from the Textus uh, Receptus and the Mesoretic uh, text in the Old Testament. And I obviously am uh, for that. Now, having said those three ways that you can tell a lot about a church, let me go back to this business of music and read just a couple of verses for you. Acts 16.25 what does that say? And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God and the prisoners heard them. Boy, that'll be something to ring the bell, I would hope. James 5.13 Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? M-E-R-R-Y Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. And then I like Proverbs 17.22 a kindred verse, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Psalm 105.2, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wondrous works. Matthew 26.30, when they had sung in him, they went out unto the Mount of Olives. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, come Come before his presence with what? Singing. Singing. I'm saying that singing, that music is one of the great parts of worshiping our God. I hope nobody in this church will lightheartedly take the congregational singing. When the song leader announces a number up here and asks us to turn to it, boy, we ought to be focused on that song for Jesus Christ. I mean, we ought to zero in on it. We are coming before our God to worship him. 
him. I am reminded of Isaiah 65, 14. Behold, my servants shall sing for joy of heart. In case you're interested and you want to look at it later, that's Isaiah 65, 14. The next two words are kind of important, and I'm just going to give you the next two words, and then you can look it up for yourself. The next two words are, but ye... In other words, my servants shall sing for joy of heart. But ye, that ought to tell you what the case is. Listen, the guy who is saved and knows the Lord has a reason to sing praises unto God Almighty. There are other verses that I can likewise cite. For instance, in Psalm 32, 7, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Isaiah 30, 29. Ye shall have a song as in the night. Revelation 5, 9. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals. Revelation 14, 3. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne. Revelation 15, 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Psalm 47, 6. Sing praises to God. Psalm 71, 23. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing unto thee. Psalm 57. My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. Now what did the fixing of the heart come about to? The next part says, I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations, for thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all of the earth. And I think it is important for us to realize that there is much about music in the Bible. I want to close with this in Psalm chapter 40 and verse number 8. Not my message. Boy, did I nearly make a mistake. I'm not ready to close my message yet. I'm closing out the reading of this uh, line of scriptures with Psalm 43. Whew. Boy, I better be careful there, hadn't I? I have Psalm chapter 40 and verse number 3. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. I like that. Now as I think about these things, as regarding the Word of God, I uh, would like to say that um, I wanted to bring this message tonight, and while it has been mostly about church music, I, I wanted to compare the church music as well as give characteristics of it, but to the world's music. And the reason that it came to my attention is because, as I'm sure most of you read, I believe it was a week ago, last night, there was a real fiasco somewhere in New Jersey. Did you guys read about the MetLife Stadium? You guys heard of the MetLife Stadium? It's a big stadium in New Jersey. I guess seats, what, 60, 80, 100,000 people or whatever. And they were having one of those hip hop, bebop, I don't know. I'm not up on that stuff, and I don't want to be up on that stuff. But they were selling tickets, big time rock bands, all that kind of stuff. And uh, they had a fight at about 4.30 on the inside of that stadium. Did any of you see that? 
And so the police had a lockdown on that stadium and, and wouldn't let people into the stadium until things calmed down. So what does that crowd do? They, they're acting like, uh, my word, a, a bunch of uh, heathen, a, a, a bunch of I, uh, jungle animals or whatever you want to call it. Uh, my word, they were... Uh, throwing bottles and rocks at the police. They were uh, climbing chain link fences to try to get in. Many who hadn't bought tickets to the thing. And I, I want to uh, bring this to your attention, if I may, as to the value of the right kind of music. I have observed that in the world's music, this, this music that many young people just fall all over themselves getting into is, is first of all bad because of the lyrics used in the songs. Amen. And I hope I don't have to go into detail on that. Anybody who's got an ounce worth of sense ought to be able to see through that thing. Not only that, but the halfway nudity that is involved in that crowd is another thing to be concerned with. A Christian has no place in that kind of uh, business. And another thing about it is it's idolatrous. I have observed, if you want my opinion, and you may say, well, that's just your opinion, Brother Burkholder, but I have observed, I've observed that these hip-hop Bebop, G Jop, jumpers, or whatever they all uh, are called, get to the point. Hey, come on, they're like idols before these young people. And instead of order, there is chaos and anarchy that comes out of that. Now, that kind of music has fellow bed, uh, fellow travelers, bedfellows with it, if I may say, uh, brothers and sisters, I hope that no Trinityites are ever caught even close to that kind of thing. Don't support that kind of thing with your time, your presence, or your money. Don't buy their music. Amen. And if you want my opinion, that goes for the whole of that Hollywood crowd too, including the movie theater and whatever else you want to call it. I, I believe that, listen, that thing last Saturday night ought to tell people something. I mean, the way that crowd was acting, one girl yelled out, they're treating us like animals. Well, if you're going to act like animals, that's the way you're going to get treated. By the way, you may have noticed in this afternoon's news, I don't know if any of you noticed in the news or not, but over in Tbilisi, Georgia, uh, their zoo was flooded out and several of their wild animals got out of the zoo. Some of the zookeepers were killed. Uh, all I saw was this big hippopotamus roaming the street. Did any of you guys see that? Yeah, big hippopotamus roaming the street. And I felt bad for the hippopotamus. Not that I didn't feel bad for the people. I felt bad for the people too. I felt bad for the hippopotamus because there was a guy with a big high-powered rifle there trained in on that hippopotamus. And I, I didn't want to see the hippopotamus shot. But you'll be happy to, I was happy to see it and hear anyway that the red dot that they put on the hippopotamus was a tranquilizer dart. And what the funny part was is trying to see six big old men trying to steer this <laughs> hippopotamus. <laughs> I guess he was happy anyway <laughs> trying to get the guy up on the curb. Well, that, that kind of thing I can go with. But this kind of thing that goes along with the hip-hop crowd of music in our world, I cannot go with. It is no place for a child of God. And I again will repeat, the lyrics alone ought to tell anybody that. Don't put your money into it. Don't go for it, whatever the case may be. Instead, listen, use whatever musical talent you've got to honor the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's where I have to come down just a little bit to uh, church music, if I may. Uh, brothers and sisters, I know that there's power in music, and, and my time is swiftly departed, so I'm going to be quick. I, I do want to cite one thing. There is power in music. Do you remember King Saul when he 
was sort of going halfway nuts. Remember the spirit of the Lord departed from him and an evil spirit came upon him. And what did they say? Seek a cunning artist in the music realm. And who'd they get? Little David. I know a man over Jesse is his dad. He, he's very cunning in the art of playing music. And they got David to come and it soothed Saul's nerves. Right? There's power in music. Now I'm sad to say that old Saul, boy, you talk about the spirit of the Lord departing from him. After he calmed down, uh, David helped him out, played the music, and the music was good for him. Uh, Saul got to thinking about David there, and Saul had a javelin close to him. He said, that David's going to be the king of the land. And Saul took his javelin and tried to nail David's uh, hide to the wall with a javelin. Two times did that. And David got out of there. I don't believe <laughs> I'd have gotten out of there too. The point I want to make is, is there's power in music. If you don't think there's power in music and music says something about you, what about Israel? When Moses came down from the mount, do you remember that business there in Exodus? There Israel was. They'd made themselves an idol out of a golden calf and they were dancing naked around it. Music does have its power for the good or for the bad. I think to myself about the world's music and the idolatry and the lyrics and the lewd actions and the, the stuff that all goes along with it. And then I think about church music. And you say, how do you put those two together? Today? Well, it seems to me like that there are a lot of churches with a mindset, how can I put this? Uh, hey, let's give them what their flesh likes to get them in the building. Let's lower Christianity down to the flesh. Uh, what do you have when you got that? You don't have a church to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. You got a flesh-filled church. In fact, I made this experiment myself, uh, believing that there is power in music. I made this experiment. And this has been a long time ago, because I don't know when the last time as I watched television. But um, this was, I was watching television, and they have on television a Christian television station. I think it might have been, is there a TBN or something like that? Anyway, um, they also had on television at that time a kind of what they call music... A rock music video? Huh? I guess. Rock? Yeah. yeah. You guys are not going to commit yourselves on this one. We're familiar with your tricky questions, Brother Burkholder. Yeah. Well, they had this rock music station. And so I turned the sound off of the TV. And, it, and I... On those remote controls, you know, you can put it back and forth, back and forth. And I, they, there were two music groups on each station. And I turned off the sound and I went back and forth between these two music groups. And after a while, I did it on purpose, after a while I couldn't tell which station was the Christian station and which station was the rock station. Now, probably if I had turned the sound back on, I couldn't have told, because I, I can't tell what they're trying to get across anyway. And some of their dissonant chords isn't music at all. It's what I call noise. Personally, that gets into the music theory a little bit, which we're not obviously going to get into that. But I do want to say this. I think it is important for Christian people to realize that when we make music, especially in church, it's for God. That's one reason why I don't like world songs to be played on our instruments around the church here. Uh, only, only Christian songs that are going to honor and glorify the Lord. Now, I admit it. My piano at the house, I may play uh, Moon River or, or uh, uh, some uh, of, of the, what I would call better uh, secular music. Uh, what they call secular music today is not music to me. It's just a bunch of noise. I, I go down the street and I, pretty soon I feel the earth shaking. And, 
And I, 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 I think, oh no, it's here. And what it is, some dude, uh, and, and they always got their windows down. I mean, it could be 99 degrees outside, and they always got their windows down. And I'm telling you, the earth is moving because of the boom, boom, boom. You guys, I mean, actually, the sound waves are moving my vehicle. I got that expedition out there. It's a fairly heavy vehicle, and I'm beginning to, to pray I get out of there fast before they blow me away. Well, unfortunately, a lot of the attitude has infected the church of Jesus Christ as if we can just tone it into the vibrations that they're going to understand. Then we'll preach to God. We'll, I, I tell you what we'll do, Brother Burkholder, we'll take the world's methods and we'll christen them. Or sprinkle them. Or baptize them. And we'll rename them. And we'll bring them into the church. And then everybody's going to love the Lord. No, they're not. They're going to be the same old unregenerate sinner they were before you ever brought them in. They're just going to have a misconstrued idea of what real Christianity is. So, I got to say... That we need to realize that our music that we're making for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is important. Let it be fitting for the King. Let it be that that is right in the eyes of the Lord. And skip that world's junk. Is, is all I got to say. Just just skip it. Just get rid of it. Boy, I'm proud of you kids. You using your talents uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I'm I, I'm so proud of the uh, the uh, the choir and the singing of the songs uh, that honor the Lord and and the hymns that we have in here and so on, folks. I got to tell you, we have a testimony to keep. And music is part of that testimony. As I speak of our need to keep our testimony, I want to close out, and this is the close of the message. Now you can go ahead and get ready. <laughs> but I, I would like to invite you to turn with me, if you would please, to uh, Psalm 137. And uh, I, I believe that we can close this out a little bit and make the point, if I may, about the importance of our maintaining our Christian life beyond just the music realm. You see, really, music is a part of our testimony. It's not our testimony. Music is a part of it. And if we're going to be able to sing right, pray right, preach right, whatever, we're going to have to first of all understand that our hearts are going to have to be right with the Lord. And to me, this Psalm 137 is going to kind of coin it for us. Here's what we have. Oh, a little background. Uh, the people of God had been carried captive into Babylon. Now try to put yourself in their condition for just a moment. Uh, how would you like to be carried captive several hundred miles away from your home and basically be treated as uh, the untouchables or whatever the case may be? Now it is true that Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego goes on and so forth. They most certainly excelled greatly. They lived for God, and you should live for God no matter where. But why were the people carried away captive? It is because they had left their first love. Am I safe in putting it that way? They had gone away from God. God had been patient with them, had he not? I mean, come on, folks. The last chapter of Second Chronicles uses a strange phrase 
about their being carried away captive to Babylon, God sent Nebuchadnezzar to do that. And the phrase that brought that about is, is a phrase in regards to his people, till there was no remedy. In other words, they had played games with God too long. They had gotten to the point where God's mercy was, well, in the phrase, there was no remedy. Now, then we come to Psalm 137. Now, look what is said. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. A lot of people don't appreciate what they've got until they lose it. We look at the next verse. Hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. That's kind of an interesting way to put it, isn't it, folks? Put our instruments up. I don't know, but uh, brothers and sisters, I love making music. I, I know it hurts people's ears sometimes, but I, I love making music. But in a way, to make music for God, you have to have the song in your heart to start with. Now look, he says, we're in Babylon. We wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there, they that carried us away captive, look at it, required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Verse number 4 ought to be sobering to every one of us. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? May I bring that into a kind of symbolic form for us? If we're not living for the Lord, we're in a strange land, as it were. And listen, their captives required of them a song. I'm thinking to myself that out there, God has made it to where his people are to be the banner carriers of Jesus Christ. And out there, they're requiring mirth. They're requiring of us a song, especially as the world compromises Christianity and Christianity follows headlong into the trap that Satan sets for it with his world. I think the world out there a lot of times is just looking to try to taunt Christianity. Sing us a song. <laughs> How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I want to say that music is very important, but if it's going to be God-honoring, it's going to have to first of all come from the heart. If you're going to have right singing, you're going to have to have a right heart. Let us stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Our Heavenly Father, how I rejoice in the music that is thine. How I rejoice in the hymns. How I rejoice at being able to sing of thy love, of thy sheltering arm, of thy hiding us there, covering us there with thine hand, the shelter in the time of storm. We could go on and on, O God. How our hearts are made to rejoice. I do pray and ask of thee, dear Lord, that thou wouldst give us the proper taste for music and help us to shun that which would not be honoring unto thee. Help us to see, Lord God, that we are to be in the business of being full-time students of thee and thy word and thy music. Grant, O oh God Almighty, that we shall see that in this business of our being full-time students, we are first of all to have our hearts right with thee. And dear God, it is, I pray, that you should 
Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things to put into music to thine honor and thy glory. I pray, O God, that you might teach us thy way and give us of thy song, the new song that only you can put into our hearts. Lord, I pray for the congregation tonight, the young people, the old people, the in-between, the whatever. I pray, O oh God, you might help each one of us to have discernment and taste in music that hopefully will honor thy glorious name. Whatever the need is of any heart here tonight, I commit it to thee, Lord. If there are those who need to come and pray about whatever it is that is on their heart, I pray, God, you'll lead them and guide them. Oh, Lord God, if there's anyone here unsaved, I pray that this night might be the night when they...